When Callinger's reign of terror ended, three were dead, including his 14-year-old son. You murdered your own son? Yes, I did. Why did you do that? He was a sacrifice. I was to murder three million people on planet Earth to see if I could murder one of my own. At the end of murdering all the people on Earth, I was going to murder my own family and then take my own life and become God. You're patient with a good ear and you try to help people. Yes. When you're not trying to murder them. Yes. When Callinger's reign of terror ended, three were dead, including his 14-year-old son. These voices from God, these hallucinations, do you still experience them? Yes, I do. Often? Often. What do you feel like doing? Killing people. You still feel like killing people? Yes. Born to an unfit mother in 1935, Philadelphia, Joseph Callinger began his life unwanted and spent the first two years alive at St. Vincent's Orphanage. Joseph would be adopted by Stephen and Anna Callinger, two Austro-Hungarian immigrants in their 40s who could not have kids of their own. They had no intentions of forming a loving family, though. You see, Sterile Stephen was an accomplished cobbler owning his own shoemaking business in the Kensington district. Thinking like a true frontiersman, he had hopes to turn his nut butter into a free labor force, but that crop had turned long ago. He also feared that without an heir, his life's work and business bearing his name would die with him. So Joseph's purpose in life would be to make shoes and nothing else. That fact would be beaten into him from an early age. What the Callengers didn't anticipate, however, was the severe schizophrenia festering in Joe's brain, or how the mental and physical abuse was going to accelerate his illness. So a series of lazy and abusive parenting decisions turned into a record speed run of Mind Melta Minor. Dude, what a rush! The Callengers had zero patience for the most trivial trials and tribulations of being parents. Which is why when a five-year-old curious Joseph asked what the word fuck meant after hearing it on the playground, he was nearly beaten to death. His adopted dad using a homemade cat of nine tails fashioned from spare shoe leather, and his adopted mom using a heavy wooden spoon. A few months later, Joseph pulled a girl's pants down at school. We've all experienced curiosity about ourselves and the opposite sex. Who hasn't? His parents could have treated it like a good learning opportunity, but they cared only for his cobbling and not his character. So they beat the child again, only this time he was being scolded as a filthy, dirty, naughty little boy. The hits just kept on coming for little Joe, and he was kicked in the dick by a girl bully at school, an unprovoked attack. When he was checked for injuries by the nurse, she noticed a hernia and informed his parents that afternoon, along with the details of the day. The Callengers couldn't believe he was a victim, now knowing their son to be a sexual predator. So after they both smacked on their infant with their favorite tools, they made an appointment with a surgeon to get his hernia fixed. Because you know what they say, a cobbler with a blown out asshole is no cobbler at all. Sometime in those days leading up to the surgery, the Callengers had a brilliant idea. And when Joe got home after 16 days in the hospital, his parents sat him down and told him that Dr. Daly had performed a second surgery as well. A surgery to remove the little demon that had been residing in his little bird. They went on to explain to the six-year-old schizophrenic that a demon was an evil spirit that worked for the devil. But the demon was gone, and his bird would never get big again. This sick little head game was an intentional attempt to make their adopted son impotent, and in effect, a more effective shoemaker. And it was after this confusing story that Joe had his first photorealistic hallucination. Stephen and Anna sent Joe to his room, and on the way, he stopped by the full length mirror at the top of the stairs. Behind him, 
floating up from the living room was a large lip knife with Joe's severed penis sitting atop the blade. As he reached down and covered his crotch in a reflex, the image vanished. Joseph's physical abuse ramped up right alongside the mental, and when he was seven years old, he stole a book of prayers from school. When his parents caught him, he was made to kneel on sandpaper every night for an hour. At eight years old, there was a witness account of Anna beating Joe with a hammer in the head for asking to go on a school trip to the zoo. He began taking refuge in old empty oil tanks near his home. He could climb down the ladder into the darkness and feel safe for a while. But this would be twisted into the next step in his descent into madness. Because one afternoon as he climbed down the ladder into the tank, he found that he was not alone. He had stumbled upon three teenage boys getting their secret gay jollies off. One was blowing another while a third was stroking his own little bird. Joe didn't know exactly what he was looking at, but before he could climb out, he was spotted and they grabbed him. At knife point, they pulled down his pants and forcibly gave him a blowjob. This encounter would cause immense damage to any child, no doubt, but for Joe, it would introduce fire and brimstone into his reality. Because evil flowed through these boys, and Joe saw his bird get big. They had undone Dr. Daly's work, and the demon was back. But what Joe didn't know was that the event unnaturally intertwined knives, sex, and religious dogma for a sick little boy. On Joe's ninth birthday, his family reinforced just how little they cared for him. After Joe reminded Anna that it was his birthday, she yelled at him for making a fuss of such things. He asked if maybe he'd be getting a present like the other little boys and girls, to which she laughed. And she said he was a naughty little greedy boy and presents were for the good kids. And frankly, this pissed Joe off. So while he was at school that day, he was outwardly destructive for the first time in his life. Joe was angry at all the other little boys and girls who didn't have to sing happy birthday to themselves. And he saw an opportunity and he took it. He snuck into the wardrobe at school and slashed the coats and buttons of the kids who had everything. And he got away with it. The abuse from the Callengers continued without too many hiccups by their bad little boy. So they started letting him go to the movie theater on Saturday while they were running their errands, so long as he paid for it with the money that he made doing chores that week. To get away was enough, at first. But Joe was always alone in the cinema, surrounded by couples, families, and friends. So he stole a roll of quarters one day from his parents' closet, so he could pay for friends to come to the movies with him each Saturday. But when his parents found out where those quarters had gone, they together held his hand over the stove, putting his fingers directly into the fire, as to burn those thieving demons right out. But Joe was so desperate for friends that he continued to take money and was subjected to the same cruel punishment five more times before he stopped. But the pattern of behavior would just evolve. Joe began having regular fantasies about cutting and stabbing women. When he stumbled upon the curiosities of pornography, as young boys do, he found he could only get off if he cut or stabbed the photos and held the knife in his left hand, his power hand. By 13, he started carving a hole in his bedroom wall that he would perch his little bird in. Time and time again, Stephen would find the hole, whoop his weird son's ass with that cat of nine tails, plaster the hole over, and soon as it was dry, Joe was carving a new hole to perch his bird in again. Every time Joe got his bird big, he was inviting the devil into his world, his reality. And it wouldn't be long before he would answer Joe's calls. One afternoon, in 1949, Joe heard a clear voice instructing him to cut somebody. So Joe grabbed one of his dad's knives and headed to the bus stop 
cut somebody. When he boarded, he saw a boy and got off when the boy did. He followed him and forced him into the woods at knife point. Demons were screaming, cut him. Joe forced the boy to pull his pants down, and then Joe ran off. He repeated this a few more times before ramping up to eventually putting the boy's bird in Joe's mouth, reenacting his own assault, and then biting down before disappearing into the brush. Around this time, a period of uh, self-discovery, if you will, he decided he would try his hand at acting. He tried out and got the lead role in a production of A Christmas Carol as Ebenezer Scrooge, and his adopted parents actually let Joe do it although they didn't care to go see it. But when the play opened, Joe was a hit. And when Joe got home that night, he told his parents that now he wanted to be an actor. They told him that he would never make it, and they demanded that he act for them right then and there. When he tried a line of Shakespeare, they heckled the 13-year-old boy, mocked him, laughed in his face, flicking water at him as he gave his monologue. You will always be a shoemaker, and you will only make shoes. And so Joe accepted his role. And he focused on making shoes and school as his mind deteriorated. He began to laugh uncontrollably at random times. <laughs> a gothic belly laugh. <laughs> at other times, he would start writhing around on the ground like a snake. And he would do it all in front of his parents. But all the while, he was getting better and better at making shoes. So his parents fortified their room, and instead of seeking any help, they elected to sleep with a baseball bat. Joe's only brief escape from this life was his Saturday trips to the movies. And it was on one of these Saturday movies that he met Hilda Bishop, and they began a romance. And although his parents discouraged their relationship, they continued to date. More than that, actually, Joseph lost his virginity to her. Then Joe petitioned to earn a wage for the work he put in at his father's shop, and he won. But this only prompted his parents to start charging their child rent. Even so, things were beginning to look up for Joe. Even God Almighty reached out to him to tell him how good of a job he was doing. In a full-on audiovisual hallucination, Joe saw a bright light, who he knew to be God appear in his room and speak to him. He said, Joe oh, Callender, you are a special person and you must undertake a special mission. Already, through your orthopedic work, you are easing pain in the feet. The feet are also the key to the brain. Your mission is to control the brain through the feet. This is what I, God of the universe, command you to do. You will use this method to heal yourself and heal mankind. You must heal and save. And so Joe began preparing to do so. Soon after, 15-year-old Joe moved to his own place while continuing to work for his father. The Callengers really didn't mind this arrangement though, because at that point they were terrified of him. He was going to need his own space if he was going to undertake this mission. But it also, for the first time, allowed him to make real friends. And his relationship with Hilda was flourishing. Although he still had to hold a knife in his power hand to have sex with her. They married in 1953 when Joe was just 17 years old. He quit school to work full time at his father's shoe shop. In 1955, Joe and Hilda had a daughter and a son a year after that. They named them Anna and Stephen after Joe's abusive parents. Hilda proved to be an awful mother and Joe was busy at work or working for God. Over time, Hilda became verbally abusive, constantly making fun of Joe's tiny little bird. And Joe was likely physically abusive right back. Their marriage fell apart alongside Joe's mental state. And by 1956, Hilda left Joe for another man. Shortly after, Joe had an episode where he woke up in another city with no memory of how he got there. And after a short stay at the hospital, he was sent home. And then Joe actually got custody of the kids. And he would take them on train rides to see their mom on the weekend. And that's actually where Joe would meet Betty Baumgartner, his second wife. And they would be married in 1958. 
and Joe was actually doing a pretty good job of hiding his sickness and presenting himself as the premier shoemaker in the area. He hid it from Betty as well. He still needed to touch a blade during sex, so he built a secret compartment in his headboard where he hid a knife for just this purpose. Joe kept it together long enough to start another family, and they would have four kids. While he was at work one afternoon, a figure in a black coat and a witch's hat appeared to him. He pointed to another set of figures and told Joe to watch carefully. What he saw was his adoptive parents and himself as a child. They were at one of his childhood homes. They had raked up a pile of leaves and his father set them on fire. As the fire grew, he felt excitement. Instantly, the vision changed. His father was holding his hand over a flame on the stove burning the thieving demon right out and then it was over and he was alone with the figure in the shop once again flames began to pour out of his mouth before vanishing he gave joe very clear instructions go home at lunch and burn down your house when joe got to his house the figure appeared once again directing him into the shed he took a book of matches and tossed them into an open can of paint thinner after watching the fire for a while, with the wonder of a child and a full raging bird, he went back to work. When he would recount this later for an author while in prison, he apparently came in his pants right then and there while describing it. He failed to completely burn the house down the first time, so he kept on trying. On his fourth attempt, at 30 years old, he finally reduced his family's home to ash. But all the while, Joe was winning awards for shoemaking, cobbling for the elites of Philly. The fourth and final attempt to burn his house down would earn him an arson charge, but he would be released without serving time after many people came forward as character witnesses. His commitment to his craft and his ability to fine tune his crazy to contribute to society allowed his obvious mental illness to be overlooked again and again. Joe and Betty moved to Joseph's childhood home and Joe took over his dad's old shop. This daily reminder of his childhood eroded Joe's already sick mind. Convinced he was on a mission from God to save humanity through the feet, he began conducting what he called experiments. He made special wedges for shoes and he would give them to anybody that would try them. He would frequently wake his kids up in the middle of the night and take them on test walks with him. This doubled as a chance to dig through other people's garbage and steal things on the way. Because like many other people with mental illness, Joe was something of a hoarder. Joe also did experiments on hamsters. He wanted to make them tiny shoes and wedges. But after he got them home, he realized that there was no way he could make those wedges for their tiny feet. So he sat them down and had a nice little chat. He told them that even though he couldn't actually make them wedges like he had planned, he would still make them little suits and hats if they had helped him with his other experiments. Joe was so sick at this point that he believed them to understand him completely, so it made sense that he was a little let down when they didn't cooperate. So one by one, he forced them to run the wheel, poking them with a pencil if they stopped. He made them run until they died of exhaustion. This was the first time that Joe had ever killed a living thing, and he must have liked it, as we'll soon see. All Joe's junk and his experiments were beginning to need more space, so in 1969, Joe bought a second house, and it was used as somewhat of a warehouse for his projects, but also to dig a path directly to hell, because on the commands of the devil, Joe woke his kids up in the middle of the night, brought them to the new house, and instructed them to take up the floorboards and dig a 20-foot hole straight down. When the hole was finished, he banned the kids from returning to the house. Joe would use his pit for something of a self-help exercise from here on out. He would climb down the ladder to the bottom of the pit, stick a candle into the dirt wall, and he would take a shit right on the floor, and then he would turn around and jerk off onto it. And when Joe did this just right, he noticed that the voices were muted and his head was clear. This is when he would have his best ideas. The bigger the dump, the better the idea. But just like his previous methods of attaining peace, this one would too be perverted. It's already pretty gross. One night, 
Defying the forces of the pit, the voices came. This time they spoke another language, though. Joe listened for a while, but he only discovered the source of the voice when he touched his neck and felt the vibrations of his own voice. And this scared the shit out of him. Literally, he took a pretty big dump. And this particular stinker was perfect. And according to Joe, the idea that he had this night released him. He decided that he would inflict his own childhood pain onto his children. It would be physical, painful, and cruel. So he went home that night and set up the cellar in their house as a torture chamber and filled it with what he called his educational materials, including rope, chains, cat and nine tails, rocks, and many others. The Callinger kids were essentially violent thieves at this point. Years of no education or meaningful discipline had caused them to go feral. Joseph knew when his kids were misbehaving because he would get an itch in his left palm, and soon after he would see a clock appear on the wall. There was a skull where the twelve should be, and it would chime. This let Joe know it was time to punish his children, and Joe's hand was always itching. On New Year's Day of 1972, a 35-year-old Joseph would hear another message. And he recognized this voice as the one he'd heard in his room when he was 15, the voice of God. But this time, it told Joe, I, I control, control you now. And since it was God, Joe complied, obviously, agreeing to follow his word no matter how violent it got. Just a couple of weeks later, Mary Jo and Joey, his two oldest kids, ran away hoping to escape the abuse. Joe didn't know what to do, so he waited on instructions from God. And just two days later, he got the instructions he was waiting on. He tucked his 45 in his waistband, hailed a taxi, and trolled the streets until he found his kids. When he spotted them outside of the theater, he jumped out of the taxi, put his gun in the kid's face, and told him to get in the car. When they got home, he told his wife to take Jimmy and Michael, the two younger kids, out and don't come back until I say. He chained Joey up in the kitchen and dropped a butcher knife just outside of his reach to toy with him. Then he turned his attention to his daughter, Mary Jo. You see, Joe had noticed some of the boys around town starting to pay an interest in her, and he didn't like it. And God had given him special instructions on how to deal with it. He took a spatula, and he put it on the stove top. He turned the stove on, and he waited until the spatula was red hot. He then pressed it against his daughter's thigh. As her skin sizzled underneath, Joseph danced over top of her singing a demented song. You'll never run away from me again. You'll never run away from me again. And then he turned back towards Joey. And while he was still chained up, Joseph beat him with the handle of a hammer until his arms were too tired to continue. And then he gave them both five dollars and they had pizza. You see, somehow, I think Joseph thought he was being a good father. He actually said what the voices told him to do with the spatula is put it inside of his daughter. But he had stopped himself, and at least he hadn't hit his son with the head of the hammer like his mom had done to him. But this time Joe's gone too far, and just a week later Joey and Michael run to the cops and they report exactly what had happened. Joe gets arrested. And at this point a funny thing happens in Joe's head. He begins to think of his children as the complete gods especially his son Michael, because he says he has a much bigger penis than himself. After his arrest, Joe had a psychiatric review, but after he was cleared, it was fine and he went home. Unfortunately, his business suffered because of the rumors spreading around town, so he went to his complete gods and he asked for a favor. Can you go back and recant what you said to the police? And the Callinger kids thought lying to the police sounded like a lot of fun, so they went right along with it. And it's right after this that God gives a really strange demand. He told Joe that after he had failed to save the world by listening to his instructions, now he's responsible for personally murdering three billion people by destroying their sexual organs. But if he does so, he'll become God. He would definitely need help in such an undertaking. So he reached out to the most complete God, his 12-year-old son Michael, and invited him into the fold. Joseph had delegated crimes to his kids before, but this was going to be a different kind of ask. He pulled Michael aside one day, just father and son, 
He told him that daddy had a strong desire to kill a lot of people, and he could use his son's help, and little Michael couldn't have been happier to do so. Michael Callinger was by his father's side at all three murders. Less than two weeks later, Joseph and Michael tortured and murdered 10-year-old Jose Colazzo. The pair hit the streets on the evening of July 7, 1974 looking for prey. They spotted young Jose walking the street and offered to pay him for some labor. The microaggression slid right off his back and he gladly accepted, following them to an abandoned rug factory where the Callinger's trap had been laid. I take it in a positive way. They stripped him naked, bound him with cord, and Joseph cut the boy's penis off with one of his shoe knives. While Jose bled out on the ground, Michael jumped on top of him and started punching and choking him. When he died, they left him there. Two weeks after the murder of Jose Colazzo, Joseph got another vision from God. In this vision, he saw a boy being thrown off a mountain, and his bird got rock hard. Then God told him that he must throw his son Joey from the cliff. But he and Michael fucked that up. So Joseph had a new vision. He saw Joey being burnt alive. So he knew that's what they had to do. But they couldn't get that done either. But the Lord Almighty is forgiving. And he let Joseph try one more time to kill his son Joey. And told him it would go down in the abandoned shops near his home. Since he was already killing Joey, Joseph took out a $45,000 life insurance policy on his son. Because why not? So on July 28th, 1974 he grabbed a camera some chains and he went and told Joey and Michael that they were going on a creepy photo shoot they went to the area foretold to Joseph looking for the perfect spot and they found an open shop with a basement the basement had a subfloor that had been removed for construction leaving a stagnant pit of dirty water and there was a ladder leaned against the wall Joseph told his son Joey it would make for a great shot if they chained him with his back against the ladder, hands chained behind him to the handles. Once his son was camera ready, Joseph pushed the ladder into the water. He and Michael watched as Joey drowned in the muddy pit before unchaining him from the ladder and leaving him there in the basement. They reported Joey missing that night but his body was not discovered for two weeks. The police were aware of Joseph's history with child abuse and the very fresh insurance policy, so they pegged Joseph Callinger as their prime suspect. When told of his suspect status, Joseph's psychotic panic pushed his mind to generate the first of many new reoccurring characters, and Charlie was born. Walking home from the police station that day, he walked down the same street that he had killed his son, when something caught Joseph's eye, he looked down the road to see the head of a boy bobbing in the distance. Trying his best to keep it together, he ignored it and hurried home, keeping his eyes fixed ahead. The pale, disembodied head had no nose or mouth. Its skin appeared thin and stretched over its skull. The eyes were pits of dark cork wiggling and pulsing, and they were fixed right on Joseph. Later, he was fixing up a pair of shoes in his shop, when the head reappeared to him there, much closer than before, and it spoke. My name's Charlie. I belong to you, and you belong to me. Bye-bye. And as quickly as he had appeared, he vanished. The next interaction with old Charlie came at a bad time for Joseph. He was in the middle of being interrogated by the cops for the murder of his son, and Charlie appeared, floating just over the interrogating officer's shoulder. Every cop in here wants to see you in your coffin. Joseph shouted for Charlie to shut up, which the officer thought was directed at him. Quickly as he had said it, both he and Charlie knew it was bad. That pig thought you had told him to shut up. Oink, oink. The insurance companies refused to pay out because of the circumstances, and the cops knew they had their man, but with no physical evidence, they had to let Joseph go. Again. Joseph and Bonnie had their fourth child to make up for the son that he had killed. But there was a problem. 
Their newborn daughter had a rare, uncurable condition that caused her skin to be covered in purple patches. But praise be, the Lord Almighty had a solution, and through a vivid dream, Yahweh told Joseph how he was to cure his daughter's illness. In one of his most psychotic visions yet, he saw a headless woman walking towards him in the street. He saw the tortured souls of hell, and the ground was covered in dancing shoes celebrating their pain. Satan appeared to Joseph, morphing into a vagina. The devil lips spoke, I know it will cure Bonnie. Take my fluid, mix it with your semen and perfume, and put the liquid on Bonnie's sores. Joseph could get perfume and he could make gush, leaving just the WAP juice in his goop skincare recipe. Joseph conveniently deemed his wife too old to be counted on. He would need a younger, healthier donor. And on November 24th, 1974, he wrapped a butcher knife in a paper sack, recruited his son Michael, and the two boarded a bus for an unlucky suburb in Lindenwood, New Jersey. After breaking into an empty house, Joseph walked with Mike until they found another with a young woman. While Michael was busy feeling out their mark, Charlie appeared to Joseph. Long time no see, not since our chat with the pigs. Get the hell out of here. Now isn't the time, Charlie. Joseph, you old horse's ass, chicken brains, fuck her up. You're a real laugh, you know that? If you're gonna be God, then I'll be the Holy Spirit and I'm gonna fuck the Virgin Mary. Wow. This is your chance, Joe. Get in that house and kill her. Michael got back and told his father there was a woman home alone. So Joe went knocking next. And after a small back and forth with the woman, Joe and Michael forced their way inside. They dragged the woman upstairs, took her clothes off and tied her to the bed. And then Michael was sent out of the room. And while alone with his captive, Joseph had a vision. He saw his double and a featureless woman tied up naked on a bed in front of him. Her mouth was open, emitting a silent scream. The man stabbed her. Joseph was confused. He wanted to do what his double had done, but he needed the fluid. Unable to bring his bird to full attention, he decided he would just mash his crotch against hers until he blew the saddest load in history, catching it in a rubber glove. He then put his finger inside her and took her non-consensual contribution and added it to the glove as well. As he turned to look back at the vision, it vanished, right along with his desire to kill. So he stole a bottle of perfume on the way out and left the woman confused and alive. Joseph's poor daughter was subjected to the concoction every day until it ran out. Her skin was unaffected. Once Joseph knew he had failed, Charlie showed up to mock him in his efforts, before showing Joe the same vision he'd seen before of his double stabbing the woman. That day he came to know his double as the supreme power. A few days later he would have another hardcore hallucination where he saw the supreme power pouring lighter fluid into a woman's eyes. So less than two weeks after his last failed schizo scheme, he was out on another mission in the burbs with Michael. And on December 3rd, they saw a woman leave her home, broke in, and waited on her to get back. When she returned from the store, she was greeted with a 12-year-old pointing a gun in her face. Joseph took her upstairs and tied her to the bed like his last victim. But this time he took out cotton balls and soaked them in a lighter fluid before placing them on her eyes. He then wrapped her head completely in tape. This is when Joseph saw the supreme power once again mirrored beside him, soaking the woman with a can of lighter fluid. He grabbed his own lighter fluid, excited to follow along, but as soon as he glanced back towards the supreme power, he just disappeared. Feeling embarrassed and confused, he again lost the urge to kill, but just as he and Michael prepared to leave, the doorbell rang. Unbeknownst to the Callengers, the woman they chose to burn like a witch had planned a lunch party. And one by one, the Callengers greeted three guests with deadly force before taking them upstairs 
Joseph had another schizophrenic vision while Mike was watching the hostages. The supreme power walked into the room, leading their four hostages. He stripped the women and cut off their breasts. Then he pulled out each woman's innards through her vagina. Last, he removed the eyes, nose, tongue, ears, and then the rest of the head. The supreme power transformed into the perfect waiter. He took everything he removed from the women back into the kitchen. A little while later, he brought out dish after dish, a complete meal. The last dish brought out had the four heads pointing north, south, east, and west. Charlie was sitting right there in the middle of them. A man that Joseph assumed to be the homeowner's husband entered his vision. The perfect waiter grabbed him before he saw anything, stripped him, blindfolded him, and sat him at the table. Joseph watched as he happily feasted on the cooked human remains of his wife and her friends. Before he could finish, the perfect waiter removed the blindfold and the man screamed, so horrified of what he saw before him that he fainted. The perfect waiter turned back into the supreme power and he bit off the head and the genitals of the man who had passed out. He shoved the dick and balls into the mouth and set it at the center of the table. And Joseph was satisfied, believing everything that he had seen to be true, that he had killed five more people. He called up to his son and told him to come on, and they went home, leaving the four people tied up and terrified. Over the next month, Joseph and Michael's break-ins and violence would just ramp up. The two committed multiple home invasions and sexual assaults in the time leading up to January 8, 1975 the day of their final murder. Like before, they found a suitable home, rang the doorbell, and pushed past the woman when she answered. She begged for them to leave as they stripped her, explaining that her sick mother was upstairs. So Joseph headed that way, intending to kill her as soon as possible, but just then, a familiar sound. Again, Joseph found himself intruding on a planned get-together, but this time he embraced it thinking of it as a more efficient way to kill. So in the same manner as before, he took the guests in, made them strip, and tied them up. The last person to be tied up was Maria Fashing, a 21-year-old nurse, and the one that would die that day. As soon as everybody was tied up, Joseph snapped into another vision, but this one was different. First, he saw the hunting knife that he was wielding, floating in front of his face with his own severed penis sitting on top. Then Charlie appeared and demanded that he cut off a penis, today. His vision became an immersive hallucination and Joe was walking down a hall. Hanging on the walls to either side of him were portraits of people from his life, and everybody was making fun of how small his bird was. Then everything disappeared except for Charlie, and he asked Joseph if he knew what it all meant. Cut off my cock? Not yours, dumb cough. The big guy on the floor. His cock. Joseph complied and drugged the man down to the boiler room. But then he had a change of heart. He went upstairs and he grabbed Maria, brought her back and told her, Chew this man's penis off or die. Maria looked back at Joseph and said, Kill me. So Joseph started jamming his hunting knife in her neck and her back and in her chest over and over while Charlie floated overhead yelling, Keep going! More! More! They were interrupted by Mike yelling down to his dad. One of the hostages escaped and was running down the street yelling for help, so they ran. As Joe fled the crime scene, he took one last look at what would be his final victim. She was standing, swaying. He later said that it looked as though she was dancing. The pair made their escape on foot. As they ran to the bus stop, Joseph found an open shed where he ditched his bloody shirt. When they got to the bus stop, they embarked for New York City to grab a slice of pizza for lunch. Then they headed home to Kensington. The bloody shirt he tossed out was discovered. They immediately noticed the name Callenger stitched in the tag. Combining that with more physical evidence collected during their recent home invasions, the police brought the Callenger reign of terror to an end on January 17, 1975, when they burst into his home and arrested him. 
Callinger's grip on reality was far too loose to evade the police, but the spontaneous nature of his crimes are the very thing that allowed him to last eight months as a serial killer. Joe and his son took buses over three states for their crime spree. Michael was put into foster care with a relative of Betty's, and he was on probation till he was 21, but then he changed his name, moved, and disappeared to history. Joseph tried to plead insanity, but the jury just didn't buy it. They saw it all as an act, and they promptly gave him a guilty verdict and a life sentence. In prison, Joseph set fires and assaulted other inmates before he finally got sent to a hospital for the criminally insane. His violence continued at the hospital, though, even under heavy sedation. So they placed him in solitary confinement in 1991, where he would stay until he died in 96.